about is that once you get to this portion of the fault down here, this is what's called the creeping section. We don't see evidence for big earthquakes there. The faults seem to be just creeping past, creeping past the two sides of the fault. While we see what we call the lock section to the north and the lock section to the south, which is where we expect earthquakes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's true. So remember that the Pacific and North America are sliding past one another at the same rate. And so that strain is being accommodated by creep on the creeping section. And so as this creeps, then absolutely, that's, that means that these sections are more likely to go. That's exactly right. Okay. So here's, this is just a map of all of the black dots are the epicenters of earthquakes, including very small earthquakes on the fault plane. You can see all of the seismicity on this section. This is a creeping section. So although it's creeping, you still see small earthquakes, magnitude 1, magnitude 2 earthquakes. Um, and so you see no big devastating earthquakes. You see lots of small earthquakes. That's what all of these black dots are. Um, and then this is once we get north of San Juan Bautista. Um, this is that the Loma section area of the fault, and then getting further north to San Francisco. And so this is the area where the Loma Prieta earthquake occurred. And so if we make a similar plot that just shows the earthquakes in 1989, it looks like this. And, and so this big circle is actually the epicenter of the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. And then these are, this is all in one year, so these are essentially the aftershocks associated with this earthquake. And so as you know, these aftershocks indicate the area of the fault that actually slipped um, in, in this particular event. And you can see this is the section of the fault that slipped in the event. And this fits nicely into this piece of the fault up here. So this was seen as evidence that this seismic gap theory works. If we can look and identify seismic gaps on the fault, we can say something about where we might expect the next big earthquake to be. Okay? And so, you know, they had made this prediction of where they expected it to be seismicity. If we look at the section of the fault that ruptured in the Loma Prieta earthquake, it does have a sort of moderate, um, uh, moderately high risk. Okay, it's not the highest by any chance. But it's sort of moderately high, although it was also considered to be very unreliable. So this was heralded as a great success that, that people had been able to uh, identify that this section was likely to have an event, and then there was an event. Okay, people became very confident in this. So what's the next? What, where else do we expect to see earthquakes on this uh, on this map? Well, of course, this path field section here. This has the highest probability by far, and also the highest reliability. So if there is one place where seismologists at the time were saying there's going to be an earthquake, it was the path field section of the fault. Okay, so why was that? So here's so Parkfield, first of all. It's probably the most famous place when it comes to earthquakes. Seismologists around the world know exactly where Parkfield is. It's actually a tiny little uh, hamlet, population 37. Okay? So while it is undoubtedly the most famous place in the world when it comes to earthquakes, um, it's just a little town. Well, it's not really a town. I don't know what you call a place with 37 people. Um, anyway, so this is why they predicted that there was going to be, or forecast, I should say, that there was going to be an earthquake with very high probability. What they recognized is that there'd been a sequence of earthquakes in 1857, 1881, 1901, 1922, 1934, and 1966. And again, this is a similar figure to the one I showed you for San Andreas, although they flip the axis. This is now date, and then this is just number. So earthquake number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. And you can see that these points, they all fall on a fairly straight line. So people, so seismologists, they drew their line through this um, and predicted when the next earthquake was going to be. So in 1985, the USGS predicted an earthquake at Parkfield in January of 1988. January of 1988. They thought they could predict it to the month. Okay. Plus or minus five years. Five years, of course, is a fairly big uncertainty, but it's not that big. Remember I said in the case of Hayward, it's like 30 or 40 years. So five years, this is actually a small uncertainty. But January, of, I love that, January of 1988. You can all see where this is going. Okay, so this is where Parkfield is, is right down there. Okay, so they predicted this in 19, so they did this in 1985. So they were expecting an earthquake, you know, two or three years later. So they went out and they instrumented the fault, because that's the smart thing to do. If you think it's going to be a big earthquake there, put out instrumentation, let's record it. Let's see if we can see some signal that will allow a true prediction, as in some signal that happens in the days or weeks before the earthquake that we could then use to say in future, we're about to have an earthquake. So they deployed a huge amount of instrumentation uh, in the region, expecting to see something in a couple of years, and they waited. And they waited, and they continued to wait for a really long time. And basically, people had given up, and then the earthquake happened. But in 2004, okay, 1988 plus or minus five years, it happened in 2004. That's a long, you know, that's way out there when it comes to uh, the likelihood based on their prediction. Um, so this is the earthquake that happened in 2004. It was a magnitude six. I didn't say that. All of, one of the reasons that people got very excited about this is that it seemed like all of these earthquakes were very similar. They were all magnitude 6.0 earthquakes, all in the same location. So it seemed like we really had identified a place where there was this recurring earthquake. Um, but and sure enough, there was a magnitude 6.0 earthquake. Obviously, it was at a very different point in time to what was expected. So this is where the point would fall. So it's significantly off the line, right? It's, it's, it's down because it's much later. It should have been occurring about here and it actually occurred um, about here. It was on the same fault segment. There was absolutely no precursory signals whatsoever. Okay, despite all of the instrumentation that was out, it was still out. No precursory signals were seen whatsoever. Okay, so nothing that you could use to then predict that there's going to be an earthquake in a few days um, or a few weeks. Nothing was observed. Okay? And there was damage, magnitude 6 earthquake. You, know, you, mean you've been around, you were around when the Napa earthquake occurred, so you know the kind of damage to expect in the magnitude 6 earthquake. There was exactly that kind of damage in the uh, hamlet of Parkfield. Typical things that get damaged, a um, uh, fireplace, a brick fireplace. You probably, as you may know, there was a boy that was almost killed. He, he did survive, but it was a close thing. Um, when a, uh, he was sleeping in the living room and a brick chimney case collapsed on him. And so that's what typically happens. Brick chimney places, they collapse. If your parents have brick chimney places in the house, you need to tell them to fix it. You could kill one of them in the next earthquake. So brick chimney places collapse. Um, bridges were offset, so here's kind of an offset um, on, a, on a bridge. And places were closed for a week or so. Um, it's kind of, as I say, it's a very famous place. This, this Parkfield Bridge is actually right on the San Andreas Fault. The San Andreas Fault runs right along this creek um, right here. And they even put up signs. So one side of the bridge, uh, this is the sign on one side of the bridge. And of course, on the other side of the bridge, they also have a sign that, for people going uh, in, in the opposite direction. Um, and most entertainingly, I, I took these photos when I took a field trip there uh, a few years ago. Um, and right underneath the sign, of course, is a full sale sign. Somebody trying to sell their property. I had no idea um, whether they were able to do that or not. And also, most entertainingly, the sign has been changed. <laughs> All right, so it's even smaller than it used to be. I don't entirely know what the reason for that was. OK, um, so that's the, that's the Parkfield segment of the San Andreas Fault. Any questions about that? So again, I really, you know, I want to, what I'm trying to do here, you know, sort of somewhat slightly mixed messages, is I want to, you know, we know that there is this earthquake cycle, that's a real thing, and we can start to try and say something about what we might expect to happen in the future, but you can see that it's very problematic to do that. Earthquakes are still a fundamentally unpredictable process. You can't predict exactly when these earthquakes are going to occur. I can predict with 100% certainty that there is going to be another earthquake at Parkfield. Okay? What I cannot do is tell you when that earthquake is going to be. That's what this, this all comes down to. Okay,
Um, and so these were identified, also identified as being gaps, so even named the Alaska Gap and the Sheridan, Sheridan Gap. I don't know how you that. You can see that there have been some smaller earthquakes in here, these small purple areas, but no big earthquakes. Um, so these are two seismic gaps, and still have been no big earthquakes there. So putting out there that these have been identified as seismic gaps in places where we might expect to see um, significant earthquakes. Of course, they're in regions that are, are very small populations, um, and so in that sense, the, the threat is less because there are a few people, fewer people who would be affected um, by, by these earthquakes. But these are. Um, uh, Examples of seismic gaps where people still think we're going to have significant earthquakes. Uh, what kind of magnitude are we talking about? Well, this event here, you can see the magnitude 8.3. Remember that the magnitude of the earthquake is related to the total area of the fault that ruptures, right? When we talk about seismic moment, the seismic moment, which is related to magnitude, the seismic moment is proportional to the total slip times the total area. So you, know, you can think of the area as being a proxy for the magnitude of the earthquake. And so what kind of magnitude might we expect? Well, this was a magnitude 8.3, so you could easily get a magnitude 8 earthquake in this gap right there. Okay? Having said that, people have pointed these out decades ago, and we've still not seen any big earthquakes there. Okay, seismic gaps in the Bay Area. You've seen this map multiple times. I'm going to show you in a little more detail. So rotate it on its side. So we have a San Andreas, Haywood, Talaveras, Concord, Grenville Fault. And I'm going to show you similar maps to what I showed you for the Loma Prieta earthquake, but these, are, these were made a couple of years ago. Um, and so Grenville Fault, um, you know, there's, there's some seismicity here, but there are other gaps, uh, areas where there isn't. On the Calaveras Fault, this portion down here, you can see there's a fair amount of seismicity. Once we get up, uh, up to sort of Concord, and the Green Valley Fault, that's up, that's up here, very little seismicity. There's a gap um, here as well. That's this gap that's right there. And so the question is here, do we start to interpret these as places where we're more likely to see big earthquakes? Right? So filling in this section here, the Calaveras Fault. It's very close to where we are, or on the Concord Green Valley Fault. When you look at the Haywood and the Rogers Creek Fault, we've looked at this, of course, in detail, and you know that there are lots of sections um, of the fault, and there are creeping sections of the fault. Um, and so up here, the northern portion, this gap here, is in St. Pablo Bay. Um, and so a lot of this is to do with our ability to see what's going on in St. Pablo Bay. Immediately north of the bay, there's very little seismic speed, and we see more seismic speed going to the north. Of course, the, um, the Napa Quake was right about here. The Napa Quake was on the, um, what's it called? Yeah, it's called the Napa Fault. Right? The Napa Quake was actually on the Napa Fault, which is this fault right here. It's not one of what's considered to be one of the main hazardous faults in the Bay Area. San Andreas Fault, very interestingly, this is the Loma Prieta earthquake, and then this is all the seismicity that happened in 1989, and seismicity further to the south. There's a little bit of seismicity further north on the peninsula, this section right here, okay? And this cluster of seismicity here is this cluster um, just offshore of San Francisco, and then it goes silent. Completely locked section of the fault north of the Golden Gate with absolutely no seismicity on it whatsoever. So that is a truly locked section of the fault. Um, and I'm going to skip over that. So, so again, you know, you, you see these patterns. We know what the recurrence interval looks like. And the way that we come up with these probabilities of earthquakes is actually by trying to combine all of this information. And you've seen this map before, but the 20, sort of basically a one in three chance on the San Andreas Fault, a one in three chance on the Haywood Fault. Overall in the Bay Area, a two in three chance of a major earthquake um, in the next 30 years. And we're going to talk to so all of the things that we talked about, the historic record, the gaps in the seismicity, they all feed into these kinds of uh, probabilistic maps. We're going to talk about this probabilistic map in much more detail in the final third of the class. Okay, so finally, I just want to touch on Cascadia because we're then going to start talking about tsunamis and subduction zones. Um, so Cascadia, of course, is different. So the San Andreas Fault is a strike slip fault that runs right through California. You get to the Mendocino Triple Junction right here and it becomes a subduction zone. Okay? The, the, the uh, plate here, what's called the Wonderful Plate, is a tiny, tiny little tectonic plate. When you look at a global map, it doesn't look like a particularly significant plate at all, but it's important to recognize that the Cascadia subduction zone can generate a magnitude 9 earthquake. This sort of sausage shape here, that's the area that erupted in the 2004 magnitude 9 Sumatra earthquake that I talked about last week. Okay? It's the same size as Cascadia. So we can expect a large magnitude earthquake up in Cascadia at some point in the future. The question is when. So here's a map of the seismicity, back to our seismic gaps issue. So the, the orange seismicity is very shallow seismicity, and the green is deep, deeper seismicity. So this orange seismicity is all associated with the plate. The point is that there's this gap in seismicity in Cascadia. There are remarkably few earthquakes along the length of Cascadia. Okay? That is something that we really do not understand the reason why that is. Why it's silent. It's a silent um, subduction zone. We know that the plate is subducting, we can see it from GPS, but we see very little seismicity going on. So when it comes to earthquake hazards, we have to try and reconstruct uh, what happened in the past. And for a very long time, people just thought that Cascadia was a silent subduction zone, there were no earthquakes. Um, and then people started to identify evidence for past earthquakes. And I just want to take you through that evidence very quickly. One of the first things that, was not, that people started to recognize were ghost forests. These are forests where all that's left is these tree trunks. Um, you can see that there is active tree growth further back, but in this, this small ground region here, there are just these ghost forests. There used to be trees and there no longer are trees. And the reason is that these, the roots of these trees are now in marshy water, as in saline water, so they can no longer grow, and so they died. And so what people realized was that this surface was going up and down. And so when it's up high, then it's fresh water and you can grow trees and then it would subside and you would flood the subsurface with salt water and you would kill off the trees. And so what was going on was this process where you had trees growing, they would then subside, you would kill off the trees, and then over time you would start to build up layers of mud so it gets above sea level again and you could start to grow, grow trees again. Okay? People also recognized tsunami deposits. So of course, what happens when you have a tsunami is that you have a big wave. The wave surge goes far on land and dumps sand, other material from the ocean, on the, the land surface and leaves a layer of sand behind. That's the telltale sign that there was a tsunami in this particular region. And here is an example of one of these sand layers that was identified in the same places where people were seeing these ghost forests. Okay, so this is obviously today's vegetation. And then this sort of grayish layer at the top um, is, is a mud layer. That's the layer that this vegetation is growing out of today. Beneath that, you see a sand layer. <coughs> And then beneath that, you see this very black layer. Um, this is the old topsoil. So this is very organic material rich. It's the old topsoil. That's why it's black. And what's more, you can see these pits that have been dug down into what was sort of sandstone beneath. These are actually uh, Native American pits, where fire pits that we use. And people have been able to date the charcoal um, in, these, um, in these fire pits. Okay? So, so we can identify sand layers associated with tsunamis. And then we have these um, fire pits that we can date uh, with carbon, uh, carbon dating. And the dates of these fire pits were between 1680 and 1720. So not only are we now starting to identify evidence for big earthquakes and tsunamis associated with them, we're starting to get a date for the last tsunami deposit in Cascadia. So if we wanted to hone down the data a little better, well, it turns out that the best way to do this was to go to Japan. In Japan, they have historic records um, going back um, much longer than Cascadia, of course, and they identified in the historic record um, that there was a big tsunami
And then one final piece of, of uh, data that, that was consistent with all of this is, is the um, tree ring. So if you go and you cut open some of these trees in the ghost forest, you can count um, the, uh, the age of, the, of this forest. And it turns out that these trees, they stopped growing. There's a, 19, uh, a, 19, a 1699 ring, but there's nothing um, in 17, 1700. So again, that's consistent with this history. So I just wanted to put this in front of you. I'm not going to talk about Cascadia in any more detail, but the point I want you to recognize is that Cascadia is capable of large magnitude earthquakes, magnitude 9 earthquakes. And the last earthquake was in 1700. The estimated recurrence interval is between 300 and 600 years. Like we have very little, very poor estimates of the recurrence interval in Cascadia. Um, so that means that we were essentially due for another earthquake in Cascadia, but it may not happen for 300 years. So I asked the question earlier, what would you do in Istanbul? Well, in Istanbul, we're talking about earthquake likelihood with a recurrence in a matter of decades. Here we're talking about an earthquake that may not happen for several hundred years. And so what, what should we do about it is a slightly different question in that context. Okay, I'm going to stop there. On uh, Thursday, we're going to look at the Japanese earthquake and the tsunami associated with it.